So you've been um, one of the things your campaign sent me was you've been uh, you've been pretty outspoken about what's happening right now with the coronavirus and the need for uh, Medicare for all. So go ahead and unpack where you're at there. Well, the immediate thing we need to do is through the Medicare system, which already exists, it should pay for coronavirus treatment. It is it is paying. The government said they will pay for tests, as I understand it. But the treatment is an average of thirty five thousand dollars. And that's going to hurt a lot of people. 87 million of us either don't have insurance or our insurance is so crappy that we don't want to use it because the deductibles and the co-pays or, you know, out of network or uncovered uh, services, it's just too expensive. So people are avoiding to see if they've got it and get treated if they do, uh, which is a public health issue. So Medicare should pay for that right now. Um, and then we have this huge problem with getting medical supplies to where they're needed. And Trump is, he's such a bumbling idiot. You know, he has the Defense Production Act. He should bring in the military and industry who know how to handle supply management and find out what's needed, where, who can produce it and organize that and get it done. I mean, we got all the states bidding against each other and FEMA's bidding. And, you know, the people that do have this stuff are, are making out like bandits. That should be a public project. It should be federally managed. Like, you know, I mentioned World War II. That was the Office of War Mobilization. We need a similar office in the federal government right now. Um, of course, yesterday the rent was due. I think there should be a moratorium on evictions and foreclosures. We need a forbearance program where people can uh, tell their landlords uh, and their utilities that, you know, they lost their job. They don't have enough income and either make a partial payment or no payment and, you know, no consequences for that. When we get to the other end, then to make up the difference between what was paid and what wasn't, uh, there should be a progressive uh, relief program. So low and moderate income people get help covering the difference of what they missed. And, uh, you know, then see, I don't want to just say nobody pay any rent or utility bills because that'll start a string of bankruptcies through the landlords, utilities, the governments depend on their revenues, the banks, and we'll be in a worse economic plight than we are right now, which is just a production shutdown. That would create a financial crisis and the disorganization of businesses that we want to get back up running when we get to the other end of this. And then uh, we should have federal rent control. I keep hearing reports of landlords using this situation to jack up the rent when people are vulnerable. And if they don't pay that rent, they push them out because they want to gentrify their buildings. It's a big problem, particularly in New York City, but in a lot of cities. And so we had federal rent control during World War II. Now is the time for that, given this emergency. And then finally, we had a housing crisis before this started. We had nearly 8 million low-income people who could not find affordable housing. We had a quarter of the population paying more than 50% of their income for housing. And the affordable standard of the federal government is 30% of income. Half the people were paying more than that. So we had a shortage of affordable housing because the private housing market will not produce affordable housing. The developers and the landlords geared to the upscale market. That's where they can make money. So that's why we should have public housing, but we need to do it right this time. Instead of it being segregated uh, housing for poor people, we should do like they do in Europe. It's open to everybody, professionals, blue collar working class, as well as low income people. And they live in the same developments and they're high quality. And we need that because we've had race and class segregation growing in this country for decades. So it mitigate segregation as well as provide affordable housing. It can be a clean energy program because we can build these to be powered by clean energy, to be energy efficient. And uh, it would obviously be a jobs program. So I think this is something we need to do anyway. And to come out of this coronavirus depression, uh, that's an obvious way to get America back to work again. Would you be for a rent strike if there was a, if there was a complete mortgage freeze as well, though? Because, I mean, you know, the way I see it, the banks have already gotten trillions. They've just gotten trillions and they've gotten handout after handout after handout. So there's no reason why I, I think anyone should have to pay rent right now to a landlord who then pays it back to the bank. Uh, there should just be a freeze on all that stuff because they've already gotten handout after handout. If there were such a thing, would you support a rent strike? Yeah, I actually put out a statement yesterday supporting the rent strikes that are going on for demands for uh, a moratorium on evictions and foreclosures, uh, for a uh, mortgage and utility and, and rent uh, forbearance program, 
and these other programs. Although I caution that people shouldn't just assume they can just go off by themselves on a rent strike. They can still be evicted. A rent strike has to be well organized. People have to be in solidarity. So they're effective in protecting the tenants who are on, on their strikes. But, uh, you know, a lot of people are looking at that, even corporate uh, tenants like Subway and the Cheesecake Factory. They're not paying their rent this month. Mm -hmm. OK, so let's get to the second part then uh, as far as healthcare. So so getting back to kind of your campaign and, and your policy platform, uh, what is your health care plan? Well, I'm for Medicare for all. Uh, I'm for immediately doing what the Medicare for all plans before the Congress do, and that is set up a national health insurance system where a single public payer covers all medically necessary services for everybody in the United States. And but I want to go beyond that. I want to go to a fully democratic and socialized health care system that covers not just who pays for the services, but how the services are delivered. So I want to move over 10 years to a national health service where the hospitals and clinics are publicly owned, where the doctors and nurses and other health care providers are public servants on salary. And the whole system is governed by a federation of locally elected health boards, one third elected by the healthcare workers, two thirds by the public. And I think that's a better system because if you just have the national health insurance, the drug companies and uh, the healthcare providers who are trying to maximize their income will just be feeding at the public trough and it, it won't be as effective at controlling costs. And also when I call for the local uh, health boards, that makes the system accountable so that we get clinics in every neighborhood, not just the neighborhoods with the higher incomes where uh, providers seeking uh, to maximize their income are more likely to locate. Uh, so we can rationally allocate resources like with hospitals now competing with each other for clients, we have an excess sometimes of MRIs, but we don't have a clinic in the, in the poor neighborhood where people, you know, I can tell you right here in Syracuse, if you're from the inner city and you wanna get a doctor's appointment in the suburbs, a lot of times, as soon as they get their address, they say, oh, we're not taking new clients. We've got problems like that. So that's why we need a healthcare system that is accountable to the people and democratic. So I want to go immediately to national health insurance and then out over 10 years, build out a full national health service like the UK has, like Italy has, like Costa Rica has, like Cuba has. Like France has, like, I mean, you know, the list just goes on and on. It's well, some of them, some of them just have national health insurance, what we call single payer. Right, right, right. Um, where the doctors are, you know, private and the hospitals are private. Usually, most systems are mixed, mm -hmm. but uh, the private sector's uh, bigger. And, you know, Italy does have a national health service, but one of the reasons they're having trouble right now and they're short, they're, they have less beds than they used to is because they went through these reforms where they try to set competition between the private in the public sector. Everybody had access to the public sector healthcare system, but the private system was competing. So everybody had to pare down their capacity. And now when they need that capacity that's gone, they're in trouble. Well, it's just such a basic notion that when you have a system set up, you know, just stripping it down to its barest essentials, you know, pretty much every other industrialized country except for us has a national system where everybody is covered and you don't see medical bankruptcies. It's just not a thing. I mean, I mean, Billy Bragg, whenever he tours the United States, he just lays it out. He's like, you guys still have medical bankruptcies in your country. We figured that out. Not saying it's perfect in England. We still got our issues. Everyone does. But we figured that out. That's not something that happens where I live. That's what he says. And he's right. And um, but when you have a system that's just set up for profit above all else, whenever there's any kind of pandemic, you're just not going to be set up for it. You're just not set up to deal with that. So you're naturally going to fail and fail miserably, as we're seeing right now. And we've been warned about this for decades. The public health officials have said uh, we need to be prepared for a pandemic and we need the equipment, the hospital beds, the capacity. Um, and the other thing going on is uh, we have big pharma, 15 of the 18 largest drug companies do not do research and development of vaccines, antivirals, and antibiotics. And we are facing uh, drug-resistant bacteria, so we need new antibiotics. And that research is not being done by these drug companies that turn around and charge us 10 times more than we would pay in Canada for the same drugs. 
Well, because well, that's where their energy is going. Their energy isn't going into research and development. Their energy is going into evergreening and all these unethical business practices, which evergreening, by the way, for everyone listening, that's basically a thing where you kind of are able to renew a patent because you change the color of a pill or something like that so that the drug stays unaffordable for people and you can maximize your profits. That's where they spend all their energy. Right. Well, I'm saying the drug companies should be part of this National Health Service. They shouldn't be for-profit entities. They've been totally irresponsible, proven they can't get the job done. They should be public utilities that operate for public benefit at cost. Get your news on with Ron. Don't you want to know what's going on? We're getting our news on today. Get your news on with Ron. Don't you want to know what's going on? We're getting our news on today. Go through it together and make it our own. Get you.